beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Here's test number one. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So if you love God, you will love your neighbor and your brother and sister in Christ. It's kind of the principle there, right? Now, when he goes into verse 7, he talks about, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old one. But then he's like, but at the same time, I'm writing you a new commandment. You're kind of like, okay, that's very confusing. Like, it's old, yet it's new. Well, how does an old commandment? Well, it goes all the way back to the Ten Commandments, right? And it goes back to Deuteronomy 6, 5, where it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then Jesus in Matthew 22, 37, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So you have the Ten Commandments, right? The first part of the Ten Commandments is focused on loving who? Anybody know? We're going to get interacted tonight. God. Okay, and the second half of the commandments is about loving others, Okay. So these two commandments pretty much sum up the law and the prophets, right? This is an old commandment. Okay? This, is all, this isn't something Jesus brought up. This is something that Jesus was expounding on way back in the day from the one who was from the beginning, right? And so basically, what I think John's getting out when he says new is old commandments, but new applications. Okay? Old commandments, but new applications. For instance, the principle is to love your neighbor, but how that looks like in everyday life is different sometimes. Um, back then, they didn't have social media. Well, now we have social media, so it means there's new applications about how to love your neighbor, how you talk about them, right? Whether you slander or what you say on social media. So that's kind of an example of how we apply an old commandment. And the work we have to do is get specific, and what does that look like to love your neighbor in everyday life? In social media, in your circles, at S&T, they, they didn't used to have universities back when, well, maybe they did, maybe a couple, but not, not, as, not as much as today. Um, but it's different, right? So there's old commandments, but new applications, new circumstances and new situations that call us to put these principles, such as loving God and loving your neighbor, in action. The straightforward explanation, though, is that whoever says he is in the light, okay, if you're saying you're in the light, but you hate your brother, that means you're still in darkness. Okay, that's very serious. That's, that's a huge thing, meaning if you are unforgiving, if you're bitter, if you hold a grudge, if you're slandering, if your attitude and your tone is one of hatefulness or scorn towards another person, maybe in this room or in your family or in the community, and you're saying, I love God, John is saying, you're lying. You're walking in the darkness. That's a serious statement. I think we need to kind of let that settle in because sometimes, you know, we, we, we think, oh yeah, I don't like this person or I have this bitterness or this unforgiveness towards somebody. But then we're like, oh, but I go to church, I go to Catalyst, you know, I read God's word, I, I do service projects, so thus I love God. But John is making it pretty clear here that if you hate your brother, if you hate your sister, that you're walking in darkness. So there's, as we go through each of these three relationships, there's something we're going to need to be aware of, a danger that we need to be aware of. There's going to be a promise or truth we're going to need to remember, and then we're going to need to act Okay, so under each of these three headings, we have beware of the danger, okay, remember the truth or promise, and then act on that promise. What do we need to beware? Number one, willful ignorance, okay, willful ignorance. What do I mean by that? John is pretty much saying that he doesn't like people who claim to be something they're not. Notice the problem here in verse, was it in verse nine? Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness, Meaning, you may not be necessarily lying with your lips, but you could be lying with your actions, okay? It's not just about lip service. It's also about following through with what you're saying. So you may not necessarily be lying with your lips, but you could be lying with your actions. In fact, Kyla brought up in last week in, in chapter 1, verse 6, he also writes the same. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, hatred, I think, is a pretty strong word in this, but I think it can mean anything, like I said, the attitude, giving a cold shoulder, bitterness, or especially the big one, I think, is unforgiveness, okay? Thinking that somebody owes you something more than maybe they actually do. And unforgiveness will usually translate into bitterness, 
It'll translate also in the way you look at other people, how you trust other people, how you act towards other people. And so if you don't deal with that ultimate problem, that leads to hatred. Now, why is that such an affront to God? Because if you don't forgive other people, then that's a sign that you haven't really understood or recognized God's forgiveness for you. Okay, and that's what comes up to what we need to remember, that Christ forgave you. What did John say to the little children? I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. I write to you, children, because you know God as Father, not as judge. So the more you remember Christ's forgiveness for you, the more that's going to influence the way you forgive others. Anybody know about the parable of the moneylender or the story that Jesus says in in Luke chapter 7? I'm not going to read through it, but I I just want to kind of recap it. So one of the Pharisees, they invite Jesus to their home, right? And they're like really inviting Jesus to kind of make fun of him, um, just to kind of embarrass him. So Jesus goes to this house, and he sits there. And this Pharisee, he doesn't kiss him. He doesn't wash his feet. He doesn't, he's not very hospitable because he doesn't care about Jesus. And he sits down at the table, and this woman, this adulterer, comes with an alabaster jar of oil. She cracks it open and begins to wipe his feet with her tears with the oil. And then, basically, the, the Pharisee, Simon, he's like, do you know who this woman is? Because if you knew who she was, you wouldn't be letting her do this. Jesus is like, let me tell you, let me tell you a story about two, two people who were in debt. One owed their master 500 denarii, and the other owed about five. And the master forgave them both of their debts. And he said, which one loved the master more? And Simon the Pharisee, he's like, well, I would, I would say the guy who was forgiven a 500 denarii. And Jesus is like, you're right. You judged correctly. And he basically explained that he who is forgiven of much will love much. So the more you recognize how much you've been forgiven and loved by God, that should influence the way you love other people. It should, just as a story. Or we can even get into the parable of the unforgiving servant. You know, the person who treated, who was forgiven much by his master, but then he goes to his servant who, who only owes a little bit and pretty much throws him in jail and treats him poorly, even though he was forgiven of much. So whenever we don't forgive our brother or we hate one another, we don't realize how much God has loved us. And that's why it's such an affront. That's why he's saying, if you don't love your neighbor, then it, you really don't get God's love for you. And you're really not loving him back. So we need to remember to love our neighbor. Well, how do we act? Okay, we need to remember the danger. We got to beware of the danger of willful ignorance, right? We need to be aware, like, are we really living out this truth? And we need to remember the gospel truth that we've been forgiven by Christ. But then we need to act on that. It's not enough to be like, okay, I know the danger. I know what's, you know, being given to me. We actually have to do something with that. Simple is, is, is seeking reconciliation, um, it, it maybe, maybe the person doesn't know that you don't like them, or maybe there is some unforgiveness. This isn't always equal to being like in a trusting relationship. It doesn't always mean you trust them again. But if you have bitterness or a grudge, you need to really ask yourself, do I approach that person differently because of the way I think of them? You need to forgive in your heart, but you also got to acknowledge your wrongdoing in the situation as well. So is there anybody that you're treating with a poor attitude, maybe giving a cold shoulder, having bitterness towards them? If that's the case, then you need to learn. We need to learn to remember Christ, how he's forgiven us, and then seek reconciliation with that person. But the more we harbor unforgiveness and hate towards one another and then say, I'm following God, that's not truth. That's lying and that's walking in the darkness. So number two, the second relationship is the relationship with the world. Okay, and if you love God, do not love the world. Now, this is kind of confusing because you're kind of like, okay, John is saying in one sense you need to love people, but now he's saying reject, hate, or don't love the world. Well, kind of put it simply here. Um, and we'll, we'll actually go ahead and read verses uh, 15 through 17. It's because we were right there with me. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. I think the simple definition is that the world is referring here to a system of beliefs and values that are opposed to who God is and what God does and what he commands. Okay, so if God is light, if God is truth, if God is love, then by definition, according to this text, the world is falsehood, lies, hate, okay, and darkness. It's not necessarily the people, but I will say this, that if you keep on loving the world, 
you will soon find yourself hating people in the world because the world praises strife. It praises violence. It praises division because it's selfish, right? That's the point. We got to pursue selflessness, and the world advocates it's all about you, all about me. It's about what I get and what I deserve. In fact, if you think about the major tech companies today, do you know what the number one commodity is for tech companies? It's you guys. It's us. It's self. Think about social media. People pay millions of dollars to get access to data for who we are because it's about selling us or selling ourselves on social media, on Instagram, on blogging, whatever the thing is. The major point of the companies is about keep selling your experience and who you are. That's the world's biggest commodity is us. Some of the illustrations, I, I really like bringing up like uh, marketing stuff because that's always interesting. Marketing is, is pretty much deception. It's the art of deception. I mean, I don't know, but maybe not. <laughs> Um, but I, I kind of want to bring up a couple of these marketing slogans that people use, the world uses, that I think really captures very well, okay, this idea of selfishness. It's supposed to be self-focused. Okay, so I need you guys to do me a favor. I'm going to name the slogan, and you shout out if you know, okay, the company. Some of these are easy, and then I think there's a couple that maybe you might not know, because I didn't know it. Okay, number one, obey your thirst. Which one's that? Gatorade. <laughs> Sprite. Okay, Sprite. I think they changed it just recently. Okay, what about have it your way? Burger King, okay. Okay, this one's easy. Just do it. I guess everyone knew that one. Okay, open happiness. Did someone say McDonald's? <laughs> That's why I'm loving it. <laughs> okay, open happiness. Someone said, I think. Coca-Cola, yeah. Okay, pleasure is the path to joy. Does anybody know that one? Pleasure is the path to joy. It's haagen ice cream. That one might be true. Um, okay, this, the last one is because I'm worth it. No. L'Oreal, yes. Wow, impressive. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that one either. Okay, so what do all these have in common? Selfishness, right? Obey your thirst. Obey your desire. Whatever you feel you want, obey that. Have it your way. You deserve your way. Your way or the highway. Just do it. Don't think about it. Just do it. If you want it, just do it. Open happiness. Even though it's a bottle of Coke with 250 calories, that you're not going to be happy. Right all the... And then <laughs> the pleasure is the path to joy. Life is just kind of a big carnival, right? Ride all the rides you want. Eat all the food you want. Get all the pleasure you can, because that's the path to joy. Because I'm worth it. Because I deserve to spend the money on this for myself, because it's about me, because it's, I'm worth it, and there's this focus on ourself. I mean, it, it's all over, you know, the way we shop, the way we do things in life. The world is set up to be like that. Well, there are three dangers here that John talks about. It's the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Okay, and the desires of the flesh, I think, kind of the, the, the general opposition to God. It's that rebellious spirit, okay? You don't like obedience, right? This, this whole thing about, if you, you know, Nathaniel opened up, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know, our, our first reaction is like, ah, oh, like, that just sounds like keep my commandments, obedience, master, Lord. Like, these are things that we generally, naturally don't want to have to think about. We, want, we don't want that. We want to be free from that, Right? So there's this rebellious spirit that sometimes we have. It's that desires of the flesh. Then you have the desires of the eyes, which I, I kind of call this like eye candy, okay? It's, it's the world itself. Pornography, sexual lust, things that look valuable on the outside, but when you really think about it, aren't that valuable. Have any of you guys ever, I know when I was growing up on the East Coast, there was a chain of stores that opened up that were called Five and Below. Has anyone ever been to one of these places? Okay. Well, I remember when Five and Below opened up in Virginia when we were living there, and it was like, you know, it was like a, it was like a youth store that was as big as like Michael's or, or Target, you know? It's like, whoa, like just for our age. And you'd go in there, and it kind of has this like urban industrial look, and they have like these huge trash cans with like, well, <laughs> that doesn't sound really appealing. <laughs> like big like industrial tubs with like, you know, basketballs and sports equipment, movies at like a really high, you know, or low discount. And then you had like CDs, music players, and all these kind of like gimmicky knickknack stuff. And I remember buying like a basketball there. And at first it's like, 
this is looks really nice. You know, it looks like a really great upscale store. Um, you know, you never understood why it was called Five and Below. And then, you know, you, you get that basketball, come home, and like within a month, it's not working anymore. It's deflated. Because at first look, it looks great. It looks awesome. But then at second glance, it's really not worth anything. Okay, because it's $5 or below. You're, a basketball for $5. I mean, seriously, it's not going to last. It's not that nice. <laughs> Ten, <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, a decent one. If you want to really spend it, you got to get $30 more. So, but the idea is this. At first glance, it looks good. But when you really inquire into the value of it, it's not that great. I think many of you in this room can attest to this fact. Okay, I don't, I don't actually need to prove to you that what the world has to offer isn't really that valuable. So I think many of you have been burned by it quite a bit. Maybe you dabbled in some sexual morality, and now you're suffering for it. Maybe you're dabbling in pornography. Is it really worth it? Maybe you're chasing after that money or fame or admiration or your athletic ability, and then you kind of feel like, well, it's not really worth it. These are experiences we know, and the Bible is just simply saying that's the fact, that it's not as valuable as we think it is. Then you have the pride of life which I also think a good word for is discrimination, okay? Not just in a racial sense, but we discriminate more than just in race, guys. We discriminate concerning athletic ability, concerning just social awkwardness, concerning our backgrounds, where we're from, what you guys are majoring in, whether you're in a relationship or not in a relationship, whether you're in the right friend group or the wrong friend group. We discriminate people again all the time. Because what we want to do is we want to be a cut above the rest of everybody else. It's this pride. Pride in what we know, pride in what we do, pride in what we own. And this is a danger that we have to beware. I like what C.S. Lewis talks about pride. I think he gives it a very good definition. He says this in his book, uh, Mere Christianity. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next man. We see that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they're not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer, or better looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It's the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition is gone, pride has gone. So pride isn't even necessarily true pleasure if you think about it, because it's not enjoying the thing itself. It's actually just about being better than the person next to you. Is that a way to live? Is that really what the world offers? Is that really what we want to partake in? So really, when John is calling us not to love the world, in the same way, he's actually calling us once again to love our neighbor, to love the people in the world. Because the value of the world is to be self-focused and selfish. And what do we have to do? We have to pursue selflessness. Well, what do we got to remember? Well, what did John say to the young men who were in the heat of the battle? You have overcome the evil one. We need to be reminded that we can overcome sin struggles, that we can overcome these temptations. Whether, whatever the struggle is, maybe it's pride of life, maybe it's the desires of the eyes, maybe it's just that general rebellion that we have in our hearts. But what do we need a reminder of? We need to be reminded that we have overcome the evil one. When you think about World War II, um, I always find this as a, as a helpful illustration. You know, when the Allies landed on D-Day in Normandy, France, right? That was the turning point of the war. And really the rest of the war, especially when Patton came up on um, the peninsula of Italy, right? And they were converging on Berlin, Germany, that really became a conquest, okay? Now, it didn't make the battle or the war any less brutal or horrifying, but there was a little bit of a change in the mindset in saying, okay, we got the turning point here. We are eventually going to overcome Germany. But like I said, it didn't change the fact that the battles and things that happened over in Europe weren't any less intense or horrifying. In the same way, it doesn't really lessen necessarily the pain or the suffering we go in this life, but it does help to know that in the end, we do eventually overcome the evil one. I think that helps a lot, and that's what we need to be reminded of. That's what he's reminding the young men. So a lot of us today need that reminder, because the trials and difficulties and the temptations in this life, it can become increasingly overwhelming. Many of you know that. I've talked with many of you about this. I've known it myself, that it's very difficult, and we need to be reminded of these truths. But I think there should be a great comfort one of the great assurances of knowing you are walking with Christ is the struggle. If you're not struggling or nothing's really going wrong in your life or everything seems to be easy in your walk, then that's when you should be concerned because there should be a struggle with sin. There should be a struggle with temptation. 
because the enemy wants to take you down. He can't destroy you, but he wants to cripple you. And so the presence of that struggle should be a comfort in knowing you're headed at least the right direction, right? And so that's always been a great comfort, I know, for myself is saying, okay, I may be in the struggle, but I know that Christ is with me. I know that just as John says, you have the word of God and you are strong in Christ. So be reminded of that today. Number three, the, the relationship, and this is really the most important one, this is what we're going to end on, is our relationship with Jesus Christ, okay? Our relationship with our neighbor, our relationship with the world, and then our relationship with Jesus Christ. How we relate in these relationships tells us a lot about whether or not we love God and are truly following him. Well, the simple fact is if you love God, you will acknowledge Jesus Christ as your one Lord and Savior, okay? Each of those words are very important. Your meaning it's personal, it's a personal relationship, one, meaning it's not, you know, a Lord and Savior out of many, but one Lord and Savior. It's Lord because he doesn't just save you, but he also is Lord of your life. He commands how you live. He is your master. You follow him. And then Savior because he's not just Lord, but he's also the Savior of your soul. You trust in him to save you from your sins. So those are all very important. You're one Lord and Savior. Now we're going to go ahead and read the rest verses 18 through 27. <clears throat> and John writes this. He says, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are all not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father, but whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. So there's a lot to unpack there, and I wish I could really get into every detail, but due to time, I'm going to have to kind of give a, an overview of this passage. But as you can see, there are people who are against the faith, against the church, who have left. Okay? And they left because they denied Jesus as the Christ. They denied him as their Lord and their Savior and have moved on. And John is saying a good test to know whether or not you're in the faith or following God is how you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord or as your Savior. See, the believer acknowledges Christ as Lord and Savior. He's anointed by the Holy Spirit. So he cooperates with the Spirit to help overcome sin, okay? But he also sticks to the Word of God. He doesn't, he doesn't budge from it. He sticks to the Word, doesn't go beyond it. The unbeliever, he goes beyond the scriptures. He's a liar. He's willfully ignorant. He says he loves God, but then he doesn't. He doesn't follow through with it. And he denies Christ as the one Lord and Savior. Maybe not just with his lips, but maybe also with his actions. So we need to beware teaching or behavior, I'll add that in there, that denies Christ as Lord and Savior. Okay, teaching or behavior. Furthermore, what do we need to remember Well, what did John say to the fathers? You know him who is from the beginning. Jesus Christ, God, was from the beginning. The Holy Spirit, they were in the beginning of the history and time. They created all reality in the whole world. They're the source of good, truth, life, light, all of it. Don't forget who is sovereign, who is providential over everything, okay? It's God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, the triune God. Don't forget that. Because that's something you need to be reminded when you come up against teaching or ways of beliefs or philosophies that say, do away with that. Let's bring in the new fad or the new thing. Whatever it may look like. It could be the prosperity gospel. It could be some new age, you know, mythology. It could be postmodern thought or relativism. Anything that denies the essential nature of who Christ, who God is. But how do we act on this? We, We beware that teaching, but we remember him who is from the beginning And not only do we think of this in a theological sense, but I also think we need to think about it in a practical or more personal sense. Him who is from the beginning in your life, where you started off in your Christian walk. Do you remember him? Him who's been with you through ups and downs of life. 
who is unchanging, who is faithful, do you remember him? Him who is from the beginning, with you in the beginning of your walk. I think that's really important that we acknowledge that in a personal sense and not just a theological sense because we can't just acknowledge it in, in, in a sense of like head knowledge but also in heart as well. Well, how do we act? Well, I, it's pretty, at first it sounds pretty simple. You acknowledge Jesus Christ. Um, but acknowledgement is more than just like, hey, what's up, Christ? Okay, on to what I'm going to do. Now, we need to acknowledge him in three ways. Privately, number one. We need to acknowledge him privately. Do you read the word? Do you pray? How many of your thoughts actually have to do with God and Christ? I always think that's very helpful. The thought life, the hidden part of our lives, the very, very, very private part of who we are, does it consist at all of a relationship with God? Do you think about him? Do you think through these things? Right now, are you going to take this passage and maybe think about it more? Or are you going to go through more, you know, in discipleship and all these other things? Are you going to think about who God is and what he's doing? There needs to be some healthy introspection, okay? Some of you maybe struggle with introspection more. Maybe some of you don't think about it enough. I think it's important to know that balance. Number two, we need to acknowledge him publicly. The, there's, a, there's a really easy one to know if you really love God. It's called the Great Commission, Okay? What does he say? Go and make disciples of all nations. If you have no idea of evangelism outreach on your radar, it's not even a concern of yours or a part of your walk with Christ, I'm sorry to say this, but that's probably a really bad sign, okay? Because if you really love God and you know that this is something truly valuable, that Christ died on the cross for our sins to save us, we should take that out with others. We should bring that to others. So evangelism, outreach. What about your conversations? Does it ever bring up? And I don't mean like be super spiritual. I know some people who are like that are like, you know, we'll, we'll see something in nature and they're like, well, that reminds me of, of you know, John 3.16. And, you know, they'll start to you know, have a soliloquy of like spiritual fluff. I don't mean that, but I mean like, is it, is it evident that it's influencing the way you work and the way you talk and the way you relate with other people and in the world? Does it really influence that? And then third is corporately, corporately. Discipleship, okay? Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's where we do a lot of our growing. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ in that? Do you gather to worship? Do you listen to the preaching of God's word? Not just in Catalyst, but in church and with other people. And I really want to emphasize, and I know this kind of, you know, I don't want to do like a shameless plug, but like, when it comes to discipleship, I really want to kind of bank on this one because as we look at the three people that John addresses, I want, to ask, I want you guys to ask yourself, where are you at in your spiritual walk? Are you new in your faith? Are you new in your faith and are you needing those reminders that your sins have been forgiven, that God is now a father, not a judge? Are you someone who's maybe been walking in the faith for a long time? Someone, and maybe not even, you may not be as old as Scott, but you, know, you may be old enough to be able to help disciple others be able to help remind them of these truths. I mean, that's what John's doing. John's an old guy, and he's writing and saying, hey, you three remember these things. Or are you a young man who's in the thick of the battle? A young person who needs to be reminded that you've overcome the evil one. I do want to say this because <clears throat> preaching is, is for 30 minutes, okay, each week. At the church, maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour, depending on what church you go to. But mainly the substance of your walk with Christ should take place in the private and corporate sector, okay? It really needs to take place in your private life. And also, very importantly, and I really want to emphasize this, is discipleship, okay? Blake was talking about the discipleship program. I can't tell you the benefit. Let me just say for the benefit for me, I've had people in my life who disciple me, okay, who I go to. And it's one thing to hear it preached. It's one thing to hear about you know, how to relate to the world and how to learn to love God. But it's another to sit down and talk with someone, talk through it, and also see their lives lived out before my eyes. Okay? That's a powerful, powerful display of how do I walk? How do I learn to love God? And one of the main, major things here we've been talking about is relationships. And the relationship, that discipling relationship is so essential. It's so encouraging to see it really play out in real life. And so I really want to encourage you guys to think and consider you know, you, you can come here and you can listen to the word preach, but I really want you guys to go, go more into it. I really want you guys to take your faith seriously. I need to take my faith seriously by being in a discipleship relationship. And that can really help you because you can talk through these things. You can discuss them. You can learn more together. 
And it's also going to teach you, when you have relationships with other people, especially brothers and sisters in Christ, it's going to teach you to relate well and to love like Christ's love. Because Christ's ministry, oops. <laughs> because Christ's ministry, I'll fix it. Serious moment, just completely destroyed. Okay. But the main point that I'm trying to get at when I conclude is find someone that you can have a discipleship relationship with. Maybe you need to be the mentee. Maybe you need to be the mentor. But I want you to consider and pray about that because you do have an opportunity. It's a really good opportunity. And I can tell you as somebody who's benefited from it and also have been able to be a discipler has grown so much in my faith, more than I could at sitting down and listening to the preaching of God's word any day. Yeah, it's important. Preaching is important. But you got to take it and you got to run with it. Let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, I thank you for um, your message, the gospel. We thank you for your love towards us. I pray that we would be reminded constantly of your grace, how you've forgiven us, um, how we've overcome the evil one, and how we know you who has been there from the beginning. We pray that you would continue to guide us. I pray, Lord, tonight that we would ask where we're at in our spiritual walk and where we need to maybe benefit from a discipleship relationship, whether we need to acknowledge you, Uh, more in our private lives, or in our public lives, or in the church. We pray for guidance. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for the gospel that you've given us, a reminder of Christ's love towards us. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.